Dennis Kucinich, outgoing congressman from Ohio, always noted for his candor, even more so recently in an interview with Adam Sullivan, who joins us today on the Fallon Forum. We also talk about one Texan's lone star struggle against the Keystone Pipeline. We got more for you as well, folks, here shortly on the Fallon Forum. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey folks, it's Ed Fallon. You know what a big fan I am of local businesses and what a big fan I am of Gateway Market. Gateway keeps its money in the local community and does a lot to support Iowa farmers. This holiday season, give them a shot at catering your event, big or small. They've got pre-cooked entrees, ready-to-go stuff, side dishes, full meal packages, and bakery favorites. Of course, that's also the grocery line they've got there and their wonderful cafe. Check them out online and also at their location at 20th and Woodland in Des Moines' historic Sherman. Hill neighborhood. Hello, Mid American Energy. I'm very concerned that you want to bill me an extra $5,000 to build a nuclear reactor. Do you know we're in the middle of a recession? Oh, we were hoping you wouldn't hear about that until after the legislature had taken action. Why not let your shareholders pick up the tab? Oh, way too risky for our shareholders. We need you, our captive. Our loyal customers to pay for it. Wait, let me see if I understand this. MidAmerican wants to build a nuclear power plant in 10 or 20 years, and they want me to pay for it now? That's right. Well, I'll just take my business elsewhere. Sorry, we're a monopoly. What we say goes. I've heard nuclear power is more expensive than other sources. Yes, yes it is. And I've heard there's no plan for how to dispose of nuclear waste. We're looking at shooting it into the sun. Well, I'm not going to sit back and let you make bad decisions with my money. We're Betting you will. Stop Mid American's power grab. Call your legislators today. 281 3371. 281 3371. Paid for by Physicians for Social Responsibility. Located in the heart of Beaverdale, Tally's offers speedy and affordable rooftop lunch, catering for events both large and small, innovative cuisine, as well as vegetarian and gluten free menus. Come to Tally's for live music, dry aged steaks, Sunday brunch, and all you can eat ribs every Monday night. Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering at 2712 Beaver Avenue. Call 279 2067. That's 279 2067. From the Remax Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Fallon Forum. Thank you, Brother Trucker, for helping to kick off this conversation. And Andy Fleming of Brother Trucker will be joining me and a whole bunch of funny people for a comedy show. It's the uh, Lawsuits Are No Laughing Matter comedy show. I'm delighted to have Lee Camp coming all the way from New York. First ever uh, show by Lee in, in Iowa. And it's going to be a fundraiser to help me keep out of the big house. That's right. Leonard Boswell continues to persist in his... Lawsuit against me, alleging that I misspoke when I said uh, the congressman and his people offered me an $80,000 a year job not to run against him. Uh, well, you know, there are three witnesses to that. So if you want to continue the lawsuit, let's do it. Unfortunately, um, actually, I would really rather not do it, to be honest. But unfortunately, uh, I have to hire legal counsel to do it. So I need help paying for that. So I really appreciate the folks who have already donated to that effect. And if you want to, you can go online to uh, FallonForum.com. Uh, click on support and find a way to make that happen. Uh, actually, it's either support or donate. I can't remember now. One of those two buttons, it will be self-explanatory. At any rate, um, I want to thank uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and the Iowa Chapter of the Sierra Club for sponsoring this program and also uh, Gateway Market for sponsoring this segment of our show. i got a few more plugs to make later in the program because this kind of alternative only exists because individuals and businesses and organizations that believe in an alternative to what you find on Right Wing Radio because they helped lay down some money to make it happen. It's a fairly inexpensive option compared to what you would pay to be on the radio. Uh, but again, you know, I'm not Walmart. Uh, I, don't take, I, don't take, I don't take support from Walmart. It's always got to be local businesses, local people, folks who believe in the issues that are important that are being neglected on the other side of the dial. Well, I am delighted to have Adam Sullivan with us on the program. Adam Sullivan, are you there? Yeah, thanks for having me, Ed. Hey, welcome to the show. Calling us, I believe, from Iowa City. Yes, that's right. So um, you recently did an interview with perhaps my favorite congressman of all time, Dennis Kucinich. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, yeah, yeah I, I was working on a story um, for the Independent Voter Network about uh, the anti-war movement. Um, and it just so happened that as I was starting to work on that, um, he had introduced a bill, uh, basically an anti-drone warfare bill in the, in the U.S. House that's uh, been getting a little bit of attention. So um, that coincided well. And, and I spoke with him last week, um, uh, mostly about um, foreign policy uh, over the last four years. Now, Dennis introduced the anti-drone warfare bill, knowing full well he would not be there next year to push it. Correct. And neither will a co-sponsor, uh, U.S. Representative Ron Paul from Texas. Oh, he and Ron Paul did it. Wow. Okay, I, I wasn't aware of that. Right, um, and since then, there's actually been a handful of other co-sponsors. Uh, Jason Amash from Michigan, who's kind of a, a Ron Paul type. Um, but then again, um, you've got Barbara Lee out in California, who's um, obviously a progressive and one of the, the leaders Dennis. of the left yeah. anti-war movement. And so I think one of the most interesting things about this piece of legislation is that um, there are only a handful of supporters. Uh, I think uh, it's seven co-sponsors now, but um, they're almost equally split between Republicans and Democrats. As, as evenly as you can split seven. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So you interviewed Dennis Kucinich recently about this yeah, about right. this bill and, and what did he have to say? And it does put him at odds with President Obama, who has right. um, escalated drone warfare. Right. Dennis Kucinich, you know, he makes the point that he's been uh, keeping an eye on this drone issue since 2005, which was well before. I think it was on the yeah. um, the public radar to the extent that it is now. Right. Um, and um, what he's most concerned about, um, I wouldn't say what he's most concerned about, with, but what the, what the bill he uh, recently introduced um, focuses on is the administration's legal justification for the use of drones um, for specifically for targeted killings. And so the Obama administration um, says that um, they have legal briefs and they have memos that say that um, that targeted killing, that what uh, the media calls the president's kill list, is, is legally justifiable, but they won't release any of those things. And so the Kucinich bill would um, require the administration to produce those documents. Okay, now to play devil's advocate, I presume that the Obama administration or the, the Pentagon, whoever's in charge of that decision, that does not want to release the names because when you do, those people uh, are more likely to, you know, end up in hiding and, to, well, and be avoided. You know, this um, bill actually doesn't um, um, have anything to do with the, the list okay. itself. Um, all, all, all the Congress would uh, um, be compelling the White House to do if this bill passed would be um, to produce the legal justification. And so, um, you know, constitutionally, uh, what allows the president to, to target an American citizen overseas, for instance? Okay. So again, 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 the the list is not so much about the about revealing the identity of those being targeted. It's about the justification for that. Right. It, it's it's um you, you know where are they finding the legal precedent to do this, and and what are their grounds for doing it? So what would the uh, what would the actual impact of that legislation be? Should it pass? I mean, again, and I understand this is probably even beyond what we call a long shot. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't think um, that this bill will pass. I don't think anyone. It's not on the radar, and obviously.
merely the uh, figurehead of the DNC, but she's also a congresswoman. Right. So it, you know, yeah. the issue is, and, and at that point when she said that, it, was, it had been on the front page of the New York Times several times that this was the case. Oh. Um, and so at that point when she <laughs> said that, either that um, she thinks that um, we're a lot more incompetent than we are and that we won't know that it's public general knowledge that that's happening, or um, she actually didn't know that. And in, in either case, I think it's troubling. Well, or she was blatantly lying to try to hide information right, exactly. that apparently has been hidden by the administration. And but I mean, at that point that she said that, it wasn't um, it, it wasn't top secret that we had tar- a targeted killing program. Okay. So basically the, the, uh, the administration, uh, the Obama administration uh, and uh, the Department of Defense and probably other agencies working with them, CIA, Homeland Security, are, right. are withholding key information about the impact of drones on civilian populations. I mean, we're, we're, we're almost certain of that, objectively. I, I, I would say that that's accurate, Ed, yeah. Especially given the track record of not even acknowledging that, that drones were being used, as you indicated right. by one you know, key Democratic congresswoman, and by even the president himself and others high up in the administration fairly recently. Um, right. It looks like, um, I mean, I can't think of a better word than lying. <laughs> I mean, they're just not telling the truth. And so exactly. to me, their, their credibility when it comes to uh, giving us information about the, the, uh, the civilian, civilian casualties, I, I, there's no credibility in my, in my book, in my book at all. And so I guess I'm wondering, in your, in your interview with Dennis Kucinich, uh, was that issue, did that issue come up at all? And, and is he, how far is he willing to go now that he is a so-called lame duck congressman, which in my vernacular means uh, totally free to say whatever the truth is and whatever's right. on his mind. Uh, what did he? How does he characterize Obama's unwillingness to confront the issue of civilian casualties? Well, first of all, to be clear, I think uh, Dennis Kucinich is a lame duck uh, congressman, but I don't think that has a whole lot of in- impact on what he does. I think Dennis Kucinich is one congressman that um, a lot of people admire him for always being oh. able to. Um, and I, and, I, and I, let me, and I would totally agree. I mean, I, I use the right. word as a general descriptor, sure. but uh, in his sure. case. He's always been very forthcoming, very, very straightforward, very, exactly. very, very accurate in his predictions about what's going to happen if certain policies don't take effect or certain bad ones do. So. Yeah. Um, but back to, your, to, to, the, to the question you said, um, uh, I think that uh, um, Dennis Kucinich, when I spoke with him, he said that um, you, there really is, is little difference between the Obama administration and the Bush administration on foreign policy. Um, and he said that um, uh, that Obama, the Obama administration has obliterated the differences, is, is the, word, the term he used, um, between the left and the right on, uh, on foreign policy. And I think that you saw that um, during the debates. I think yeah. um, when uh, President Obama and uh, Governor Mitt Romney were on stage together talking about foreign policy, um, they had some disagreements, but uh, I think in in general they were they were small disagreements. They and part were, part of that um, is because the with the big picture. Part of that is the ever changing nature of Mitt Romney, who uh, you know came sure. more and more to Obama's you know point of view during the uh, right. final months of the campaign. But um, but, uh, but again, think, Ed, Ed, on that point, I think it's important to say that Mitt Romney came to Obama's points of views, which have traditionally been Republican points of views. That, exactly, that's um, a very good point. The administration that the things yes. Obama is saying now aren't things that Democrats would have said, and they certainly aren't things that candidate Obama would right. have said in 2008. I think really, really good point, Adam, because uh, you know Mitt Romney did not come to share Democratic points of view. He came to share Republican points of view that right. top Democrats have embraced for. Uh, way too long now, since at least the Bill, Bill Clinton administrations. It, and we still call those Republican points of views, but I think within the next few years, that's no longer going to be the case. I think that um, we, uh, you know, we may not see there's going to be a Democratic primary process um, in, in the next four years, obviously. And I don't know if we'll see an anti-war candidate. Um, the last, um, last go-around, we had Dennis Kucinich in the race, and we had uh, President Obama, then candidate Obama, who um, yes, he was he, made to be the peace candidate, but I don't know if that was really the case. Well, yeah, he came, well, and, and that was founded on one vote. That was founded on his opposition to the resolution to go to war in Iraq. Which he didn't even vote on. He said that if he'd been there, he wouldn't have approved it. But um, he said that after the fact because he wasn't a U.S. congressman at the time. Good point, yeah. And we had, of course, Ed John Edwards be- backing away from his vote and Hillary sticking right. with it. Um, yeah, so we'll see whether we get a, an anti-war. Well, the only anti-war candidate we had this time was Ron Paul. Who, right, on the Republican side. And, yeah. um, I think, um, you know, uh, part of um, what I was writing about when I spoke to Dennis Kucinich is the um, anti-war sentiment on the left. And um, one thing I was thinking about is it, it's hard to measure um, where that sentiment went. I think um, I looked at the Democratic caucus results and, and only, I th- I'm sure you know this, but only 1% of 
um, caucus, Democratic caucus attendees caucused um, uncommitted, which mean, meant that 99 percent of people who showed up at the caucuses think that Obama is doing a, a fine job. Well, um, and, then, no, I, and I wouldn't go that far, Adam, because it's at it, it, it many caucuses and, may, and maybe even at most caucuses, because it it's hard to get a sense of the entire uh, entire lay of the state. But at right. a lot of caucuses, there was a very, very concerted effort to suppress any folks who wanted to go uncommitted. It right. was, it that's, was, that's, it was very strong. The democratic process in the caucuses kind of um, allows for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying. Mm. Um, but, but another point to be made is I think that 2008 is the first uncontested democratic caucus in modern times where um, um, they changed the process, um, where instead of reporting results to the county uh, chairs and then to the state, they reported them straight to the state. And so in 1996, um, there's talk that there were there was a little bit stronger uncommitted movement in 1996, but it got suppressed because county chairs just didn't submit the right results. Uh, and in 2008, that didn't happen. Or, sorry, 2012. Right, I gotcha. Yeah. So again, again, back back to um, Kucinich. I, right. I, I, I'm still trying to fully process something you said earlier regarding um, his his uh, saying or implying. Would you tell me which that on on foreign policy there was no substantial difference, no 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 difference of any significance between the Obama administration and the Bush administration? Did did I hear you right? I think that's about right. Maybe not quite as strong as that, but I mean, I can read you a, a direct quote. Sure. He says, as a matter of fact, that much of Obama, that the Obama administration's foreign policy is a continuation of the Bush administration's foreign policy. Left-right analysis fails here because through the president's obliterating the differences, what we now have is the requirement that members of Congress in both parties um, protect the Constitution. Um, and that's what I'm calling on Congress to do. Um, it's not about left and right. It's about right and wrong. And so uh, I think the, the case Kucinich is really making is that um, you know, while Democrats in general might still be a lot stronger on peace issues, um, I think the point he's making is that um, practically speaking and politically speaking, um, anti-war uh, people need to treat both parties uh, somewhat the same, that the people, anti-war people on the left and anti-war people on the right need to come together right. and realize that, um, that their politicians on the left and right are, are one and the same to a large extent. And two things I think I've heard there. One is that He's not really indicting the Democratic Party per se. It's the it's, the, it's this Democratic administration. One, sure. and, and the second point is he is saying that this administration has obliterated any differences between it and previous Republican administrations, i.e., Bush, right. on foreign right. policy. Right, and I think "obliterate" is, is a really strong word to use. It is a very strong word to use. Throughout the differences, or he smudged the differences. He said he, he, that it, it's obliteration. Okay, but the fact too that his resolution is garnering. Very, very minimal support. Out of 435 members of Congress, seven have signed on, and right. uh, they are split as evenly as you can split seven, uh, half and half, half Democrat, half Republican. Um, but, you know, and to some extent, his criticism extends to the Democratic Party itself. I mean, I wonder what he would say to your congressman, Dave, Dave Loebsack, who supported the defense authorization bill, mm -hmm. uh, ostensibly because he felt it was a jobs bill and important to employment in his district and in Iowa. I mean, the two things cited by his staffer were the jobs at Rock Island um, right. and, and the, the potential for more jobs, uh, military-based jobs at Rock Island, and the need to keep jobs at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the, um, the F-16 uh, F fighter unit at the Des Moines airport, which, again, are being right. phased out for drones. That's a, that's a hard one to, you know, to come. There, I don't know if there's a right side on that issue, but then yeah, jobs I is not a very good argument either way. Right. I think that um, that what we're going to face moving forward is the reality that even people who aren't anti-war are starting to come around to the fact that we can't afford the foreign policy that mm -hmm. we have. Um, and when we start cutting the military budget, we, we are going to lose jobs. And that's just a fact because um, we've built up uh, an entire industry, a huge industry of, of military suppliers um, that we don't, um, if we want to have a foreign po policy, a smaller foreign policy and a cheaper foreign policy, we don't need those industries. And so it's basically eliminating a big part of an industry and jobs are going to be lost from it. Um, now, and so now, um, at, it, it's, go ahead. Now, and and I mean, you're in your, in your work as a journalist, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you there. You, do you focus uh, mostly on foreign policy or do you look at the the broad spectrum of, of issues? Um, I, I mostly focus on uh, focus on Iowa politics, actually. Okay. But oh, really? okay. um, I focus a little bit on national. When I when I focus on national politics, it's often foreign policy. Two questions, and and, and again, you're a journalist, but you have opinions clearly, which is good. I think journalists should have opinions. I, I mean, I try to, um, um, you know, I'm report I'm, I'm reporting to you what Dennis Kucinich told me and how right. how I think that fits into the national. Um, I, I've never been an anti-war activist. I've never 
um, attended the protest, things like that. I, I don't have um, strong views on a lot of things I report about, but um, you know, I'm telling you what Dennis Kucinich right. said and, and how my how I interpret that to play into the national political narrative. Okay. And do you do you do you think Kucinich, even though he says the the distinction between the Obama administration and the Bush administration on foreign policy have been obliterated, uh, right? Would he be? Does he? Would do you think he would? Did he say anything to indicate uh, his sense of the importance of having a Democratic Senate? Uh, to counterbalance the Republican House, or is there a sense from Kucinich that that even those distinctions aren't that important anymore? Um, I, I didn't speak with Dennis Kucinich about that, but I think um, you know if you're an anti-war person and you look at um, what just happened in the Senate over the National Defense Authorization Act, um, I think you would have mixed feelings about um, how the Senate feels about those issues. Um, I think that you know, like I said, like I said, the NDAA um, things that just went through the Senate, I think, are a good illustration. Uh, and what I'm talking about is. Um, a few senators, Senator Rand Paul and um, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California specifically, um, were calling to um, to curb the administration's ability to indefinitely detain American citizens. Mm. Um, and it caught some flack from Senate leadership. And so I think that kind of demonstrates um, how Senate leadership feels about this, these yeah. issues. <laughs> well, it's discouraging. It, uh, it encourages... Uh, it encourages people to want to abandon both parties and start something new and clean and fresh and more representative of the broader public interest. Because, you know, as you pointed out, polls on the war in Afghanistan show a clear, strong majority opposition to continuing them, to continuing the war. Right. I mean, it's bipartisan. And, and one thing to, to pay attention to in the next few months, in the next year or so, um, is they're going to be talking about... Um, what kind of presence the United States is going to have in Afghanistan after the Afghanistan war ends. And there's a good chance that um, it's several thousand troops, that it's not just a few hundred troops. And, and so I think that's something that people need to keep an eye on in the next few years. And, wow. and it will be a good test of what Obama foreign policy in the second term looks like. Yeah. Um, because there is a case to be made that, um, you know, some people have defended Obama saying that if he didn't have a little kind of a hawkish foreign policy during his first term, um, and if he didn't um, do a few of the other things that progressives have been with, upset with him about, um, but if he hadn't done those things, that he wouldn't have been as electable. And so okay. there's some sense that maybe in a second term that Obama will um, have a softer foreign policy, that um, yeah. that he'll uh, curb the drug war to some extent. And we're seeing how those things will play out in, in the next few weeks, actually. Yeah, so. I mean, it's, it's really we are, we're going to know whether the rubber meets the road on those issues. Uh, and also on the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, that's that is pivotal. You know, sure. he sent mixed messages on that issue during his first term. Uh, I mean, if right. you, if you could say anything substantive came out of the Obama administration on that very very key environmental and energy issue, it was that he, he did authorize the southern portion of the pipeline, uh, and so it looks to me like he's going to continue going in that direction. But again, I think if he wants to um, provide folks like me in the uh, in the um, base any any confidence. Uh, He's going to change his position on it, and and again also on some of these other issues that you mentioned. Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. And I think, um, you know, what we saw in the first term is um, there was still resistance from um, the environmentalists and from the anti-war people, um, but I think that those movements were a lot smaller and, and maybe less active than they had been um, when George W. Bush was the president. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see how um, now that Democrats have secured the White House for four more years, now that they um, don't have to worry about damaging their own candidate for the next election. Um, we'll see if they put a little bit more pressure on him. Right. And obviously, Ed, you're a good counterexample to that. You've been, um, you, throughout uh, um, the Obama administration, I think you've been willing to criticize him when he needs to be criticized. But I yeah. think there are other, um, or I guess you don't consider yourself a Democrat anymore. But well, no, but I, I, I do get a lot of flack for, uh, you can't say anything bad about the president right now. He's in a tough re-election campaign. Or you right. can't say so anything bad about him right now because he has a split Congress. Or the right. first now, two years. So, you can't say anything bad about him because we've got to give him a chance to work with this new Democratic Congress. There's always some exactly. reason not to be a critic, and I think that is uh, absolutely wrong. And I also think that, um, you know, during the election when you brought up criticisms of Obama, I think that people were apt to say, okay, well, that's true, but it's also true of Mitt Romney. Um, and now that there's no Republican opponent to compare him to, yeah. I think um, it'll be interesting to see if, um, if the left and progressives um, kind of hold Obama to his own standard rather than just holding him to yeah. um, – up, up against a Republican. Well, Adam, thanks so much for joining us. I'd love to have I you on my program it. next month to get your take, uh, since you do follow state issues quite closely. Right. I'd be interested in your take on the uh, early weeks, the first couple of weeks of the Iowa legislature, seeing what's going yeah, to be happening up there. So, All right. 
Thank you, Adam. Adam Sullivan, folks. And if folks want to reach you, Adam, where do they do? Uh, AdamBSullivan.com. And that's where you can find uh, some information about my interview that we spoke about with Dennis Kucinich. Adam, um, and I'm also on Twitter at Adam B. Sullivan. Adam B as in boy, Sullivan.com. You got it. All right. Thanks. Best of luck. Thanks, Ed. Hey, I want to thank Gateway Market for sponsoring this segment of the program. Gateway is at 20th and Woodland in Sherman Hill. It's uh, not just our neighborhood grocery store, but they provide such a wonderful variety of foods from, uh, again, a lot of it from local farms, uh, that uh, they should be your grocery store as well. Uh, and again, they keep their money local, unlike the big chains and, the, uh, you know, and, and places like, heaven forbid, you should ever shop at Walmart. Uh, you know, Gateway Market's uh, owners... Staff, everybody, they're connected here to Des Moines. The money you spend there stays here. And again, it's not just the grocery store. It's breakfast, lunch, and supper in their wonderful cafe. Uh, and also, this time of the year, think about their catering service. For your event, big or small, they can cater any event. Give them a shout at Gateway Market uh, online or, uh, again, stop in at the store at 20th and Woodland. I want to thank uh, Megabus, too, because uh, they're going to be hauling me around the country next week. And they better treat me really, really good because... Um, uh, that's going to be an interesting t journey. I'll talk with you more about that, and we'll have somebody from Megabus telling us about uh, why that's um, an item of interest and uh, why it's needed. We'll have, uh, we'll have uh, Mike Alvik with Megabus on the show later this week. All right, folks, I'll be back in a few minutes. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the pipeline a bit more and one Texan who has taken it upon himself to kind of be a one-man opposition uh, you know, effort to the pipeline as it tries to tear through his property. We'll be back in a few minutes, folks. Stick around. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm a burrito. I'm a fighting burrito full of fresh ingredients prepared before your very eyes. I don't have eyes. I have over 28 options and 268 million combinations, including Rizzo for vegetarians. I can take my meat off and call myself vegetarian. Put that back on. The fighting burrito is locally owned. I'm owned by some big corporation somewhere. Say, you want to go on a date? No, thanks. I'm seeing a quesadilla. The fighting burrito online fightingburrito.com. Join the fight. It's time to think about upgrading the efficiency of your furnace and air conditioning. Conditioner. Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling has provided honest, competent service for over 20 years. Whether it's your home or business, for repair work or to install a more energy efficient furnace or air conditioner, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. That's 263-0422. For honest, competent heating and cooling service, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. Times are tough, and most people are just trying to make their cars last a little bit longer. That's why you should know about Sargent's Garage in Des Moines. You can trust Sargent's to make the right diagnosis and give you a fair price. Whether it's a routine oil change or a major repair, Sargent's always does outstanding work. So don't give up on that old car just yet. Call Sargent's Garage at 246-8149. That's 246-8149 for Sargent's Garage. I love driving to Newton to see the races. Me too, but I only have to drive across town. You live in Newton? Yep, Newton's got small town charm and it's close to Des Moines. I love the safe, friendly neighborhoods and family-owned businesses. And Newton's wind energy industry is really taking off. How'd you find your home? Dan Kelly with First Choice Realty. And Dan helped me find my office too. Next time, instead of just speeding by, I'll stop in and check out Newton. Why don't you check out Newton? Call Dan Kelly at 641-521-9260 or Kelly at mchsi.com. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. Well, hi, I'm Rob Spearman. I'm a broker owner of REMAX Real Estate Concepts in Des Moines, Iowa. 
Give us a call if you're looking at buying or selling a home. Or if you're having trouble on your mortgage payments or looking to purchase foreclosures, we have the agents to help you. Experienced, outstanding agents. Our office number is 515-276-2872. Or if you'd like to look at homes, go to our website, homeconnectusa.com. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Mr. Babers, neighbors, folks, a great local band. Uh, and I want to thank, um, I want to thank uh, Fighting Burrito for sponsoring this segment of our show. And I want to congratulate all my friends who happen to turn, who happen to have birthdays today on the 12th day of the 12th month of the 12th year of the 21st century. How special is that? And actually, my Facebook friends, <clears throat> I've got 10 of them who have birthdays today. Jamie Woodson, Bruno Piggott, Joyce Hasseltine, Ryan Crane, Linnell Wagonman, Deb Russell, Athena Sutton, Nathan Wright, Dan DeGeest, Aaron James. Congratulations on turning yet another year older and probably wiser. Anyway, folks, happy birthday. And, you know, 12-12-2012, um, a very significant day. I know I see people all over the place uh, in, the, in the newspaper, online, pondering the, uh, the um, significance of the number 12-12-12. Well, here are my three 12s. Okay, here, here are my three 12s, right? Here we go. Maddie. The 12 Disciples. I know Mac, J. Michael McCoy is going to be so happy that I put that up on my show. Uh, but I do think that for the most part, even though they were somewhat clueless, they had to be pretty bold individuals to leave their lives of fishing and, and whatever else they did for a living and to go off and follow some guy who really probably at the time did not seem very promising. So a tip of the cap to the 12 Disciples of Jesus. Okay, oh, the 12 signs of the Zodiac. You know, I got to admit, my sign is uh, the sign of the skeptic. I just have never really bought into the, the zodiac thing, the astrology thing. I do think, though, that those imaginary shapes up in the stars look really, really cool. And I am really glad that some, um, some Babylonian or Mesopotamian or some, some ancient person decided to create these things. But do know, folks, that the uh, stars are always shifting. So what might look like a virgin today or a lion today or a big honk and scorpion today you know, when you're, when you're looking up there 10,000 years from now, it ain't going to be the same. So enjoy it while it lasts. But the best 12-12-12 in my world, Tom Brady. Yo, Tom Brady. Okay, Maddie is just, uh, Maddie's drooling. She's falling in love with Tom Brady as we speak. Must be what I'm feeling right now. What? That must be what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> right now. Anyway, Tom Brady, congratulations on absolutely romping over the Texans the other day. Uh, honorable mention in terms of 12s go to Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback for the uh, socialist Green Bay Packers. Anyway, um, we have more important things to talk about than silly numbers. Uh, I do want to talk about this, um, this uh, right-to-work law passing in Michigan. Um, unions are under attack like they have never been before. We're going to talk about that. But first, um, landowners are under attack in Texas. Uh, compliments of the southern portion of the Keystone Pipeline being approved. You know, again, this is, um, this is really... You know, whether or not I absolutely, totally, forever abandon the Democratic Party is really contingent upon this issue probably more than anything. Uh, if the president decides to go ahead with the pipeline, you know, not only am I done, done with any, I just, I just can't imagine having any more interest in being anything remotely involved with the Democratic Party. But, you know, we, may, we have such a horrible challenge on our hands already with climate change. You add all the additional carbon from exploitation of the tar sands into the uh, scheme. And, and you've got quite a problem. You've got a problem that I think is, is unfathomable. Okay, so big news out of Texas yesterday. A Texas judge ordered TransCanada, that's the company responsible for the pipeline uh, up north, um, they, it was ordered to temporarily halt work on um, private property where it has been building part of this uh, pipeline uh, it's an oil pipeline designed to carry tar sands from Canada to the Gulf Coast, okay? Um, now, the uh, guy standing in the way, the guy who sued, is a landowner by the name of Michael Bishop, and he is defending himself. He hasn't hired a lawyer. He's braver than I am. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm only battling one congressman, and I wimped out and hired a lawyer. He's battling 
the entire forces of corporate, you know, oil. Um, <laughs> he's an international, uh, co international, uh, uh, you know, coalition of, of oil interests, and he's battling them themselves. Okay. So um, he filed his lawsuit and uh, argued that TransCanada lied to Texans when it said it would be using the Keystone XL pipeline to transport crude oil. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, I thought it was supposed to be transporting crude oil. Here's where the guy got clever. He, um, he's hanging his hat on a technicality. Okay, tar sands oil, the stuff they're hauling out of the, uh, this region in Alberta, it's really um, diluted bitumen, which, again, I don't really know much about that either, but um, another name for tar sands oil. It, it does not meet, technically, it does not meet the definition as outlined in Texas and federal statutory codes that define crude oil as, quote, liquid hydrocarbons extracted from the earth at atmospheric temperatures. That is the official uh, description of what is crude oil. Okay, so... Bishop points out that um, when tar sands are extracted in Alberta, Canada, the material is almost a solid and has to be heated and diluted in order to even be transmitted. Okay, so again, you, you know, you and I, you know, in reasonable conversation, are probably not going to haggle over the fact that this is, this is oil. I mean, and we've even made that point. But he hangs his hat on a technicality that is now currently stalling this project. So David Dodson, who's a spokesman for TransCanada, for the, for the opposition here, for the uh, defenders of oil, has said, said the courts have already ruled that tar sands are a form of crude oil. Now, we'll see if the, if the courts apparently hasn't convinced the court yet. Um, and the company said that in a statement yesterday and also said that work on uh, Bishop's property, in other words, condemnation and building the pipeline, is underway and that the injunction will not affect construction. Well, I hope he's wrong. Uh, now, environmentalists, according to this uh, AP story, this is curious to me because um, the story says that environmentalists uh, don't like the pipeline because they're concerned about leaks or a spill occurring, as has happened in places up north, in Canada, in Alaska. Uh, and they're also concerned that the heavy tar sands will contaminate both water and land. Okay. Uh, the article also points out that environmentalists uh, have raise concerns about refining this product, and in the process of refining the crude oil, uh, it will further pollute the air in Texas, because that's where the actual refinery is going to go. Uh, that's where the processing will take place. They're concerned that, we'll, that it will um, further pollute the air in the Texas Gulf, Gulf Coast, and that is, is of concern because that, that state, Texas, um, among states in the U.S., leads the uh, nation in greenhouse gas emissions and industrial pollution. What I'm surprised is not mentioned in this article is the major concern that environmentalists have is the effect on the climate. And, uh, I mean, that's the issue that Bill McKibben and others continue to raise, that if we open up this vast reservoir of, 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 uh, of um, crude oil, you know, again, contained in the tar sands, uh, it, it could be game over for trying to do anything to stem the worst, uh, worst momentum in climate change. All right, um, folks, uh, phone line is 244. Uh, Sorry, 244-0077, I see we got a call, but give me one more second here to tell you a little bit more about this feisty Texan who's taking this on on his own. Okay, Bishop, Michael Bishop owns about 20 acres, uh, north of about 160 miles north of Houston. He's a Vietnam vet and um, says that he fought the company's attempt to condemn his land, but then settled because he couldn't afford the legal fees of 10000 now, this guy's 64 years old, probably never had to do this before. So um, he says he settled with the uh, company under duress. So decided after that to buy a law book, law book and decided to defend himself. And since then, he has filed a lawsuit in the Austin court against the Texas Railroad Commission, the state agency that oversees pipelines, arguing that it failed to properly investigate the pipeline and protect groundwater, public health, and public safety. Now, Bishop is well aware that this uh, oil company is going to have uh, a, you know, a, a plethora of lawyers and experts coming to this hearing next month. And he says he's not deterred. He's going to continue to fight. He says, bring them on. I'm a, I'm a U.S. Marine. I'm not afraid of anyone. I'm not afraid of them. And when I'm done with them, they will know that they've been in a fight. I may not win, but I'm going to hurt them. <laughs> I like the guy's spunk and spirit and... Um, 
and I hope he does well. Let's go to our phone lines. Who do we got on line one, Maddie? We have Frank. Oh, Frank, he come wants on. Wants to talk about oil. Okay, but you're not going to tie it to scripture, are you? Ed. Yes. Can I be the first guy to punch your game over card? Um. The game is sure. over. Obama is going to sign that pipeline. Uh, you're, you're, I, don't, I don't know if you smoked anything in your college days, but you're smoking something if you think he's not going to sign that pipeline thing eventually. I suspect you're probably right. And no, I'm not smoking anything. And so get, so get used to uh, get used to joining the party of uh, abstaining from your own party because I'm abstaining abstaining from the Republican Party. So now you can abstain from the Democrats. Well, I. I... There, there were plenty of occasions back in my tenure in the U.S. in the Iowa House where I, I was the lone vote on issues. Well, um, Ed, if, listen, uh, it, it, it's pretty simple. It's part of China's stated policy that they're willing to take oil by force. So, do you think the United States is going to stand by and 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 not get their slice of the pie? I well, mean, no, not, that's that's long been our policy is to take oil by force. Ask Ron well, Paul but, about now, that. but now it's China's policy. So, uh, do you think we're going to let China outdo us? Um, no, but they may. Uh, you know, their 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 economy is becoming larger than ours. Would it be Quickly. safe to say? Would it be safe to say you're you're a cook? A cook? Are you a chef? Are you a cook? Are you a pretty good cook? No, I throw stuff together and I like it and it's good. And most of my friends will smile and eat it with me. Well, if you don't follow the recipe, what do you usually do? Do you go back to the recipe book for uh, further further advice, further instruction? You always want to abstain from the Bible, but we keep getting in these problems in the world, and, and, and we keep ignoring the instruction book. Uh, maybe that's the difference between us, Frank. When I cook, I don't I mean, use, was, I don't use it was, recipes. It was clearly stated, it was clearly stated that uh, information would increase in the Bible, and uh, man would run to and fro. Well, where did we go to all this running to and fro without uh, fossil fuel? Let me it ask was you meant this. To be, it was meant to be found, and it was meant to be used. Let me ask you about this. Uh, this this Texan sounds like your kind of guy. He's uh, he's a Marine. He's uh, a gun, o- gun owner. He's feisty. Gun owner. He's, a, he's a landowner. Um, and he's he's fighting you know, on his own uh, against uh, all odds to try to stop somebody from taking his land. Now, that sounds like your kind of guy. Well, yeah, I'm for I'm for landowner rights. Uh, that's no problem. But is this going? I mean, is this a, a diversionary route that they're taking? I mean, see, there was a, a designed route, and Obama got in there and started. Uh, there was something about they was go. Oh, well, we had to move go around this uh, duck pond, and we had to move around this. We had to move around this to make all the environmentalists happy. I think it was called the Sand Hills and the Ogala, Ogallala Aquifer. Ogallala. Uh, Sand hills yeah. or whatever. Duck pond. Uh, you can call it a duck pond if you want to be cute. Okay. Well, nice. anyway, a, a, a duck oasis, whatever you want to call it, even though the ducks don't fly south anymore, but um, they all stay up here at the Casey's in uh, the north end of town. But what was your I point? Mean, I lost your point in all that duck talk. Well, the the, the point is, is I'm against. Uh, I, I'm for personal property ownership and the rights that go along with that. Okay, good. So you're, you're, you 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 support the, this guy's right to stop the pipeline. But 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 you're but you're ever bit willing to have a, a, a private property owner put uh, windmills on his property. So if a private landowner wants that pipeline to come through his property, I'm assume I assume okay. you jump on board with that too, right? Well, except there's a problem here. I, I can put up a, a wind turbine on my farm, and it doesn't affect your farm next door to me. But if I agree to put a pipeline through my farm, and presumably that pipeline is going to continue, how's that going to hurt your, How's it going to hurt the next guy's farm? The pipeline? Yeah, because it's got to go through that farm too. I mean, a pipeline doesn't just stop at one farm; it's a continuous incursion into property. Well, what happened when we put the interstate system in? Do you think somebody got put out? That and the railroads. Every time as they well. put a new bypass and a highway in, somebody gets moved. Somebody gets paid. Somebody gets their palms greased to move. Yeah, and maybe you know, maybe that's not. Maybe we should be a little bit slower to do that. You know, years ago. And 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 and, and, and every time somebody doesn't want to, they have to end up moving that uh, bypass around their property. Yeah. Well, there's a property de- de- heading down to Pleasant uh, Pleasantville that they had to go right around the property. Well, Frank, let it be said that I'm I, I'm the guy on the side of the uh, U.S. Uh, Marine, the feisty Texan fighting the big corporation, and I gosh, I, I, I wish we could, I wish we could side, have stood together on this one. Frank. Would, would you be on that guy's side if he voluntarily wanted that pipeline to come through his property? No, you wouldn't. Um, no, I know I'm. Again, you, you're missing the point. The, Wanting a pipeline on your property means nothing if your neighbors don't want it as well. 
Or, well, what does the neighbors have to say about my property or your property? Right. Why should it... It's a pipeline. It goes this way. It's not a yeah. window. It's not this. It's this. Okay. Well, all this stu- all this stuff has to be pre-organized before the pipeline goes through. You got to get all your ducks in a row, as they say. Oh, you're so talking about wants... ducks again, Frank. My gosh, I tell you. <laughs> so if everybody <laughs> wants it to come through, are you okay with that? No. Um, for other reasons, no, but not because of the, this. This is not an issue of land rights or condemnation. It's an issue of policy. So, but you know, um, Frank, I got to move on. I want to talk about something. I know you're going to be right. definitely. You, if you want to stay on hold, you can. I'm no, talk I'm, about... I'm actually watching you on computer. You have a computer, Frank? No, but I'm at one. Oh, you're at one. Okay. Did you I'm steal? At one. You, you didn't steal it from somebody, did you? Yeah. You did. All right. Oh, ain't mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell All you right, what. Goodbye. All right. I'll see you, Frank. Uh, thanks for calling. Um, yeah, I want to talk about this uh, situation in Michigan with the uh, right to work law. And I want to thank uh, Fighting Burrito for sponsoring this segment of our program. Uh, Fighting Burrito is at uh, 13th and Locust. It's in the Nationwide Building. I am having lunch there. Um, my bike is having lunch there with me. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I can't remember what you had last time, bike, uh, if you even eat burritos. Oh, man, I don't. Um, the Susan B.? Yeah, you might have had that. I think that's that what would I make had. sense for a a, a a a female bike with uh with progressive liberal leanings. It was really really green. Green. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, yes, bikes can not only talk but uh, they can eat as well. Anyway, Fighting Burrito is um is the uh, brainchild of Matthew Goodman, an Ames resident who has an, a restaurant in Ames by the same name. This is fairly new in Des Moines, but it's a great place. It's a custom burrito place. You can make your own burrito. Again, they do have the Susan B. Anthony and the Cesar Chavez and a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, styled burritos named after famous people, but you can make your own. I highly recommend it. They're very affordable, very tasty, and, uh, and the staff is fun to, to talk with. That's Fighting Burrito at 13th and Locust. I'll be back in a few minutes, folks, with conversation about the, uh, the vote in Michigan relevant to right to work. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Well, good morning. This is the 7th of June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno, one, of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute. There's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on Webcast One Live. We're going to look back on this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there, too. But actually, it's the beginning of Webcast One Live. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together. And uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. Hi folks, it's Ed Fallon here. Proof Restaurant at 13th and Locust. You've probably been there for their award-winning nationally recognized lunch specials. And here's where the chefs really get creative. Uh, Let me tell you, they're like artists, okay? I've been there and it is one of the best meals I have had in Des Moines. I've heard that from other people. You got to check it out. Proof for supper. Do not assume you can get in. Make reservations. Contact Proof Restaurant online at proofrestaurant.com or 244-0655. That's 244-0655. 0655. Ludwig von Beethoven here. I used to be so, so tired all the time, not from composing and playing, but from moving my piano. But now I feel so much better. I call S&P Piano, and they will bring my piano anywhere. 
They also sell and rent pianos, used ones, new ones. You get the idea. Call S&P Piano right away at 208-6453. That's 208-6453. S&P Piano. Nestled in the heart of downtown, Ritual Cafe is one of Des Moines' most unique places, offering a wide variety of coffee and tea. Ritual Cafe also serves the only all-vegetarian menu in town. And Ritual Cafe is a cultural hub for artists and musicians, with a performance stage hosting local, national, and international talent. Make Ritual Cafe a part of your daily ritual. On 13th Street between Locust and Grand in downtown Des Moines. And check out ritualcafe.com. Wow, some wedding. Yeah, I've never seen a bride in coveralls. Right, and skipping down the aisle to accordion music. Not to mention the reception. That wedding cake was a freaking fruit cake. It's your wedding. Don't leave anything to chance. Diana's Wedding Cakes. Using only the finest, freshest ingredients with free on-time delivery and setup. Choose one of Diana's custom designs or create your own. Call Diana's Wedding Cakes, 641-275-9279. That's 641-275-9279. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. It's Pump Town, folks, kicking us off here in the uh, final segment of this show. I want to thank uh, Tinker Heating and Cooling for sponsoring this segment of the program and remind folks to do their part. Uh, you know, we don't, this doesn't work unless individuals and businesses and organizations who believe in the issues we address go to my website, uh, send, a, send a check in. Better yet, sponsor a program. For 30 bucks a month, you can sponsor a program. Uh, or for 15 bucks a month, you can sponsor half a program. At any rate, we rely on that to make this happen. Um, please do it. And again, Support the businesses that do advertise on this program. They will always be local businesses that are doing good work. Okay, so um, let's go to our conversation about the Michigan governor signing the right to work law. Uh, 244-0077 if you want to join in, 244-0077. Um, this is being described as a significant defeat for organized labor um, in the U.S. I mean, again, Michigan you know, has been the... Of all states, that's the state where the labor movement has thrived. Um, but Michigan now joins 23 other states with a right-to-work law, as we have in Iowa. And, of course, it hasn't been the end of the world in Iowa, but um, it's not been good for Iowa. I mean, there have been efforts to try to change right-to-work. And, again, the idea that, that you can benefit from the negotiations that labor union members pay for and yet not contribute to the process that resulted in those improvements that's not fair. Anyway, that's my take. Um, there was quite a movement um, of opposition. Again, not as significant as what we saw in Indiana earlier this year and in Wisconsin last year. But um, again, part of the problem was Republicans in the Michigan legislature acted so quickly. They brought this thing up out of nowhere uh, a week ago Thursday. Um, they passed it, and within five days it was done down to the governor's desk. He signed it within a couple, couple of hours. I mean, people were given no time. There were no public hearings, no conversations, you know, and they argue, of course, that, well, it's fair, but what they, I mean, there's, there's so many things that aren't being said by the, uh, by the folks who support this so-called right-to-work law, uh, and what they did in Michigan was absolutely wrong. I'm surprised. There, there were a few arrests for people being um, upset about it. I'm surprised there weren't more. Again, let's, um, 244-0077, let's go to our phone lines. Maddie, who do we got on line one? It's Ron. Hey, Ron, how are you? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ed. You know what? I didn't see this coming at all in Michigan. You're right. It came up quick. And you know what? They dropped the big one. The labor movement's over in the United States. It's gone. Forget about it. Why do you say that? A right-to-work law in Michigan. Okay? Michigan is like where all the great labor battles were fought and won in the 30s with the car industry. When this happens in the UAW's backyard, it's over. There's nowhere to go from here. It's just over. Okay, the strategy that, la that, that labor movement uh, leaders are encouraging is to organize in the retail sector, the very 
the, the, the large number of very low wage, and even part-time jobs with no benefits at Walmart and other places like that, they're, they're, they're saying let's focus on that. So well, is, lots, of, lots of luck, because it doesn't matter, because we already talked about this. We talked about this with uh, Tom Gagan. The law is against them. I, I mean, it's, it's against the law to organize unions. People don't realize that. To organize, effectively organize unions is against the so, law. So you're saying a right-to-work law effectively nullifies the, uh, the, the, uh, the attraction of organizing a union? Well, it's, it's worked everywhere else like this. Yeah. Okay, it's it's just going. You know, capitalism needs a constant source of cheap and docile labor. It cannot stand any kind of active labor. It can't stand labor that has any kind of negotiating leverage. It has to wipe it out by its necessity. And this is the greatest capital victory in our lifetime. This this is the big one. This is Hiroshima and Nagasaki rolled up. Wow, that's uh, that's quite a claim, Ron. And I and I and I respect your opinion about it, but. Again, uh, you, and what you... I've noticed, what I've noticed is when this stuff happens since 19, I mean, going back to 1947 with the Taft-Hartley Act, the Democrats, the labor movement, never successfully rebounds. They never get repeals. They never recall the politicians. Uh, I mean, Scott Walker is a perfect example. All of the liberal hoopla about the rising of the people in Wisconsin. Scott Walker still in office. The legislation still stands that cut the heart out of public sector collective bargaining. Okay. You know, so, that's just okay, the way but, it is. But, but, Ron, here, here's the problem. Um, without labor unions, you will have injustice in the workplace. You will have horrible working conditions. I mean, I mean, right now we would not have the 40-hour week. We would no, we would still have child labor in this I'm country. We would still have. That point. Well, I know, I, but, I, I, but I'm saying I'm saying that when there, where there's inju injustice is an imbalance in the system. It's an imbalance in our society. Right. And, the, the, the all, I think the only way you're going to address that imbalance, well, maybe not the only way, but the historically the logical way is through workers uniting to demand their rights and demand safe and know, fair conditions. You know, you know, and people are not taking the Republicans seriously. With Paul Rove and the other Republicans, they straightforwardly said, "We want to repeal the 20th century. We want to go back to William McKinley." You can look this up, okay? Yeah. They, 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 they view the, the presidency of William McKinley as the height of American civilization. They want to go back to that mentality. They're not kidding, and people think they're kidding. Yeah. People think they're moderate. They're, they're going to moderate, that they're going uh, to compromise. They're not. They're like terminators, okay? Yeah. There, there's no negotiation. There's no compromise. There's no, uh, there's no appeal to compassion. This is what they're out to do. Well, um, Ron, I've got to run. It's uh, Time is up. I, I do want to talk about this more. And uh, I know that you've helped uh, recruit a, a wonderful um, nationally known guest for our show on Friday. Uh, Richard Wolf is going to join us. Yeah, and I'll be, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be there for that, too. Great. Right. And uh, we're certainly going to get his take on the so-called fiscal cliff, but maybe with the breaking news from Michigan. Uh, Mr. Wolf right. will have an opinion about that as well. I believe, in uh, fact, I saw... I, I, I bet you he will. <laughs> I believe I saw something coming through the uh, online online news yesterday from him, in fact. Um, also Friday, folks, Mike Alvick with Megabus is going to join us. And uh, Jody Brecht, a, uh, an author and poet from Ottumwa, will be my guest in the studio. Um, tomorrow, Thursday, Leonard uh, Freeling. He's a former judge. He's with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We're going to talk about the... Uh, changes the shifting ground in marijuana laws since the last election. And also tomorrow, State Representative Dan Kelly will be my guest. Again, I want to thank uh, Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling for sponsoring this segment of the program. And again, please support the businesses that support this program. It makes a difference. Uh, you know, Give Tinker a shout at 263-0422. 263-0422 for any furnace issue you've got, any air conditioning issue. And if you haven't had a winter check yet, you know, give them a shout for that, too, because you really want to make sure your furnace is up to snuff moving in to what hopefully might be a real winter. I want to remind folks about the uh, January 13th comedy show with Lee Camp. The uh, lawsuits are no laughing matter. Comedy show to help raise funds to keep me out of the big house. That's going to be January 13th at 7 p.m. at House of Bricks. I want to thank Webcast One Live for, for uh, providing the studio for the show. I want to thank my glorious producer, Maddie Arrington. And I want to remind you, Bradshaw will be with you next. Thanks, folks. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. 
Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, Home Comfort Heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am Administrative Manager. I am the Senior Technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do?